Hello and welcome back to World War One TV. It's been a while. Um, yeah, sorry about that. September just flew by. Um, as I said in my little update on the on the channel, I don't know why, but the older I get, the quicker time seems to go. Does that continue? I don't know. <laughs> Um, yeah, but it was really good. I mean, we I was super busy. I went and saw Woody at We Have Ways Fest, spoke there, which was really fun. But then I got COVID, boo. But I'm fine now. Um, and so we've got a bumper week, uh, a bumper week, a bumper month of shows coming up in October. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And today we're we're starting um, at a slightly unusual hour for World War One TV, but that's to accommodate a show uh, down under um, with Robin Pryor. And it's something that you guys have been asking for since we started the channel, really, and, and me and Woody both said from the off that we want this to be as international as possible in terms of the things that we're discussing. Um, and so, yeah, today we're going to be discussing really just a, a pretty chill chat today um, to give an overview on Australia's kind of contribution to, but, but also really uh, the legacy of and how... I suppose, how the wars were um, responded to in Australia, both first and second. So without further ado, um, I'm going to stop my wittering and uh, introduce uh, Robin. Hello, Robin. Hello, Lucy. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, well, we had a little chat beforehand um, about a few bits and bobs, and I guess we, we decided that we'll start with the First World War and, and kind of discuss really um, the, maybe a bit of the political backdrop or how that initially kind of went down in Australia when... Britain declared war and yeah I mean feel free to sort of kick us off and we'll see where we go. Right well in 1914 Australia was a dominion by an act of the British Parliament in 1901. Uh, the question was what did it mean uh, to be a dominion um, and what it did not mean was that you declared war on your own. Um, Looking at how Australia came to declare war in 1914 is very interesting because when the crisis came up, we were in the middle of an election campaign. Um, uh, the capital was uh, uh, Melbourne, uh, not Canberra, and the uh, two protagonists, uh, Cook uh, for the Liberals, that is the Conservatives, uh, and Fisher for the Labor Party were out campaigning uh, when the crisis hit. So what did they uh, do? Uh, did they declare war? No, they didn't. You look through the records and you find that no Australian leader declared war. Who then declared war on our behalf? It was the king, George V. Um mm. It took a lot of research, actually, to find that. You have to go through Hansard, Australian Hansard, uh, nothing there, uh, nothing in the cabinet uh, documents, not that they kept many in those days. Uh, and it turns out that it was George V. And when Britain declared war, Australia was automatically at war. Um, there was no real question about it. Um, this wasn't a political issue in 1914. Both sides of politics uh, agreed that that was the case. There was no discussion. Uh, there was no debate. None at no all. Any, nothing. We just declared war, uh, as did um, as did Canada and uh, New Zealand uh, in rather the same fashion. So. Although we're a dominion, we're a separate country, uh, we did not have our own foreign policy in 1914. We had Britain's foreign policy. And uh, whatever that policy was, um, that's what we had. Uh, what was the reaction to that uh, during the remainder of the election campaign? Uh, none at all. It wasn't an issue. Um, the leaders decided that we would send um, 20,000 troops, I think it was, in the first instance. And that was that. Um, there was no controversy. Uh, there was no debate. We just sent the men. And that ra raises another question. Although Britain could declare war on our behalf in 1914, we could decide, and this is what a dominion actually meant in 1914, we could decide what we did with that declaration. 
did we raise an army? Because, of course, it was the Australian Parliament that had to raise the money uh, to send an army, equip it, and, and so on. Um, we could have decided, George V notwithstanding, that we weren't going to take part in this war. And if we'd so decided, that would have been that. I don't think the British fleet would have coerced us into the war in 1914 uh, or anything like that. So it, it was up to us. And this so is. The Dominions did have a level of autonomy then in that kind of decision making yes, process yeah. after. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is what Dominion status meant in 1914. Uh, we'll come to, come to what it meant in 1939 later on. The 1914, it meant that. Uh, it meant that we had autonomy, uh, we had agency. Uh, we didn't necessarily have to follow Britain, uh, despite the rules, as it were, saying that we should. Um, and that was that. Was that. Uh, we were in the war. There's a, the, the, there's a, a, a thing about this. We enter the war. One of the best summaries of this is in the film Gallipoli <laughs> uh, of notorious uh, fame. Our two heroes are going off to Perth to join up and they meet a camel driver, an uh, Afghan camel driver in the middle of Western Australia. And he said, where are you going? And they said, we're off to join the war. And they say why and the two young men say well we're being threatened and the camera pans around slowly into thousands of miles of nothingness yeah. um, it's devastatingly clever if you want to take the view that this is someone else's war um, yeah i mean we this, had um this, Sorry to interrupt, Robin. I was just going to say we had uh, Teresa Yacobellion from um, a Canadian uh, war, war museum, and um, it's kind of a similar theme of this idea: the war was taking place so far away. You know, this geographical distance, this space between, didn't really align with the Dominion status and, and, and that response in terms of the, the political closeness, or you know that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I mean, what the film Gallipoli is saying, what that camera shot is saying, is where's the threat? There's no threat. Um, where's the enemy? You know, well, uh, 12,000 miles away. You know. um, mm. it, it's quite clever if that's the line you want to push, which the filmmakers actually did want to push in, in that film, that this is none of our business. Uh, we're not threatened. Uh, but, of course, there's another view to that, that we were threatened um, uh, because what was protecting us is the Royal Navy, and uh, any threat to the Royal Navy uh, in 1914 was a threat to Australia. Um, we had German colonies in New Guinea uh, to our near north uh, and Samoa in the Pacific. They were soon mopped up by us. Um, we got off the mark faster than we could be ordered to get off the mark from London, as a matter of fact. Uh, <laughs> Uh, somebody muttered, I think, in the cabinet about the sub-imperialists in Australia <laughs> needing <laughs> no encouragement uh, to take over what German colonies we could. So we took over New Guinea, uh, New Zealand took over Samoa, uh, and, 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 and so on. Um, the other thing, though, is looking back at this declaration of war with today's eyes, which is the wrong way to do it. Um, we were not those people. Mm -hmm. We are a different people now. We were not those people. Who were those people? They were almost all Anglo-Celtic. Um, well over 90% of Australia was in those, in those years. Um, there'd been, in fact, a huge influx of migration from Britain in the years 1911 to 14, which were somewhat depressed in Britain. And we got especially a lot of young men looking for work. Um, and they are to form part of the first AIF, the first Australian Imperial Force. Um, 
which rather gives the lie to how Australians fought vis-a-vis -vis other people. Uh, <laughs> uh, when you think about it, they were other people. You know, yeah. They were largely British, actually. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the idea that Australians are natural soldiers and all this stuff uh, has a bit of a struggle with that one, I think. Oh, the old, uh, the old Anzac Superman. Yeah, yeah, we we were we were supermen because we were Australian and we came from the country. We didn't actually; we came from the cities. Uh, we're the most urbanised country on earth. I think outside Belgium in 1914. Amazingly, wow. yeah, that's yeah, amazing. amazingly urbanised. Yeah. God, um, yeah. Robin, just a quick question that's just come in from from Jay. Just um, were the Australian states still separate politically in 1914, or no. not? No, okay. um, you might argue they're still separate now, but uh, uh, the COVID response was run by the states rather than the Commonwealth. But uh, uh, no, uh, we the, the Act of 1901 was to get us all together. Um, it was in Britain wanted it, uh, we wanted it. It was uh, easy for defence policy. Uh, each state had its own little militia and a fort down near the sea somewhere to ward off the Russians mainly. Um, that's mm -hmm. when they were built in the 1880s when Russia was considered to be a threat. Um, but there was no national defence policy. In the Boer War, for example, the South African War, uh, initially the states send contingents, not Australia. Um, we become Australia during the Boer War uh, and the later contingents are, in fact, Australian, but the original ones were not. Uh, it's to put an end to that sort of thing, and it's for defence okay. purposes, to some extent, that we become a country. Yeah, uh, that's, thank you. That, that really helps clear that up. Thank you. Yeah. So here we are. We're, yeah, the thing about looking back at us uh, from today's eyes is we were actually an offshoot of Britain in 1914, this is why there's no debate over entering the war. Uh, we were British uh, to the core. Um, I mean, when, you, when you're speaking of over 90% of a country of Anglo-Celtic uh, background, you're speaking of one country, one solid mass. Um, there was no real debate over, uh, except amongst a few, I'm sure the international workers of the world thought we should, the wobblies thought we shouldn't be involved in anything. Uh, but, the, you know, these are tiny minorities. Uh, the Labor Party, uh, the, the, the Conservatives, the, the Liberals, as they're called here, um, are of one mind. Uh, and seemingly so are the people. There is no great controversy. There's not a march in the street saying we shouldn't be in this war. Nothing of that kind whatsoever. Um, it's wrong to see us separately from Britain in 1914. We are an offshoot of Britain. Got you. And we are going to long remain so, actually. Yeah. But there were, I mean, I don't know if you're going to come on to this, but there were debates over, like, conscription was quite a big issue later yeah. on in the war. I mean, what, what's interesting is, you know, we, 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 we enter the war uh, we go off to Gallipoli, escorted by a Japanese heavy cruiser because the Royal Navy <laughs> can't spare one, um, which has certain ironies for later on. Same and, enough. of course, we go to Egypt to train uh, because there's not room in, in Britain uh, for us to train, and that's how we get involved with Gallipoli, uh, which you know, goes pretty badly, you have to say. Um that's 1915. In 1916, the first conscription debate comes up. Um, and that's an interesting one because you have to have, because we have a written constitution, you have to have a referendum every time you want to change it. And uh, that was uh, deemed essential. Uh, was it a referendum about the war? That's the interesting question. It probably wasn't. It really was about conscription, and we really didn't want it. Uh, by this time, Billy Hughes has become prime minister. Um, he's keen uh, on conscription. The AIF, uh, especially after the Somme, uh, is down on numbers. Uh, recruiting, not surprisingly, is also down. 
uh, and Hughes calls the first conscription referendum in 1916, which is defeated. So he calls another one in 1917, and that's defeated too. Um, we have a fine tradition of defeating referendums on almost every subject you can think of. Uh, I think less than 10% of referendums have ever got through in Australia. We are constitutional conservatives before we're anything else. There's another one. We've got one on October the 14th to give Indigenous people a voice in Parliament, uh, an advisory committee. It's almost certainly going to be defeated. Um, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind and, of a and, bit of a national look, part, trait. Yeah, um, and part of the reason is they're all defeated. <laughs> I mean, you, you you put up a referendum, it'll be defeated here. Yeah. What what? I'm sure if you had a referendum on giving everyone a thousand dollars each, <laughs> that too would be defeated. Um, so it's not it's not pure reactionary. It's 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 that's what we always do. So in the first of all, yeah, we defeated the referendum deal twice, 1916 and 1917. It becomes political then, uh, mainly because we, uh, I was eager to call us Anglo-Celtic. We have a, a large Irish uh, population, especially in uh, what we in South Australia call the Eastern States, uh, Victoria, New South Wales in particular. And you've had the Easter Rebellion by this time. Uh, and the Irish Australians are now thinking, maybe we should not be in this war. Maybe this is somebody else's war. Uh, maybe our war is in fact with Britain. Um, yeah, I mean, forgetting, of course, that there are a couple of Irish divisions fighting on the Western Front. <laughs> 16th and the 32nd Division, I think, at, at this very time. Uh, so it becomes politicised to that extent. And Archbishop Mannix, the Catholic Archbishop of Melbourne, runs really the, the, the no campaign, the no conscription campaign. But uh, I think, by and large, it's really about conscription. And we really don't want it. We want to maintain our all-volunteer army, which which we do, um, which we do, which is partly the reason, of course, we don't have the death penalty. Um, all our men are volunteers, yeah, and uh, despite the uh, best efforts of uh, the Governor-General, uh, uh, Sir Douglas Haig, and some others who want to introduce the death penalty, uh, we won't have that either. Um, and that's a political decision uh, made by the Minister of Defence uh, and repeated by him on every possible occasion. So that, that's why we don't have that. Yeah. I think the, um, from my um, sort of, you know, my, my reading and, and over the years on Australia is not my speciality, but this idea that you mentioned earlier, this idea of kind of, um, you know, the Anzac legend, actually the, the fact that, Australian soldiers were all volunteers becomes sort of almost embroiled in that it's a, it comes as sort of part of national pride of that in that sense I think there's an element of that kind of leads into this valor this this mateship yeah. and all that stuff yes um I think it does um the, the, I mean the one shock here is when Britain introduces conscription in in 1916 um we are fairly shocked about that uh, why, sh why should they have to do that? The, the argument about equality of sacrifice doesn't go down at all, mm. interestingly enough, in a so-called egalitarian country. Um, doesn't go down at all well uh, here. People think you must uh, be allowed to say no uh, if you don't want to fight. Um, and uh, uh, we, we find this a peculiar uh, decision on Britain's part in particular. Um, so sort of foreign countries like Germany and France, what else can you expect, you know, I mean, <laughs> foreigners. Uh, but the British to introduce conscription, that's something else. That's, that's not, not quite a proper thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the myth starts pretty early, uh, the, <laughs> the Anzac myth. I mean, it's already forming in Egypt, I think. We haven't fought anybody yet. Um, 
it, it, it's starting off. Um, and I think in particular, because the first soldiers we fought were Turks, and we had the usual racist attitude to that. You know, they were, they were inferior. Uh, we wiped the floor with them. And the fact that we didn't wipe the floor with them, of course, was not our fault. It was Britain's, um, yeah, <laughs> which is sort of why it is. <laughs> I mean, what a ludicrous plan. But, but the, there it was. Uh, uh, so you can see the formation of this myth, starting with soldiers' letters from, uh, from uh, Egypt and continuing uh, on the Gallipoli Peninsula. By the time we get to the Western Front, it's well and truly running. Uh, we are we are superior soldiers. Uh, we've been done in by a dud plan at Gallipoli. You wait till we get to the Western Front. We'll show them. Uh, and of course, what helps that along is in 1918. And so it said we do show them um, for the first and last time in our history. We fight the main army of the main enemy on the main front and beat them. There's the Anzac myth for you, <laughs> encapsulated in one campaign from August to November, uh, or in our case, October 1918. Yeah. Um, and, of course, you've got Charles, Charles Bean into the mix. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's pretty influential. Um, he's got a ludicrous chapter. If anyone wants a good laugh after the show, they should have a look at his chapter in the last volume of 1918 uh, called The Old Force Passes. And it's been summing up uh, of what makes us a great soldiers. Uh, and he goes uh, on about who is the bravest, he says. Clergyman's sons, he decides. He, of course, being, guess what, a clergyman's son. Um, <laughs> And then, of course, people from the country. If a brave deed had been done on the Western Front, it was more or less likely that someone would say, yes, they're lads from around Shepparton, which is a small Victorian town. Actually, the odds of them saying that were practically nil because we all came from the cities, uh, especially Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, that's where most of the first AIF came from. The rest came from Brisbane. Adelaide and Perth overwhelmingly and Bean sort of knows this and, and, and has a difficult moment uh, and he says well yes I know a lot of us lived in cities but we went to the country on our holiday so we were well versed in country ways I mean this is pretty pathetic stuff actually uh, it's, it's pretty feeble and uh, it's surprising that it's still got a following uh, in this country, uh, people still go along with it and they go along with Bean's interpretation uh, of it. Um, it, it quite, it's very tenacious. And, of course, films like Gallipoli do nothing but reinforce it. Despite the filmmakers, you feel, these are country boys, aren't they? They've just broken the 100-metre record, which was 100-yard record, I should say, which would still stand, by the way. It would. They got the timing wrong uh, in the film. <laughs> 9.8 seconds or something, you know, faster than Usain Bolt, um, <laughs> which is not bad in bare feet on a, on, on a dirt track. No. They did all right. They were doing all right in that film. I think, yeah. I mean, part, part of it is it's, you know, people like nice stories and people like stories of almost like there's an element of the underdog sort of showing them, you know, that there's that side of it. And that those, those tales will go on forever. I fear, you know, it's yeah, very difficult yeah. to counter that. And look, the people, the other people we're showing, of course, are the British. <laughs> or should I say the English, uh, because Britain was never called that. In 1914, it was hardly ever called that in my lifetime, actually. It was England. Um, we were showing the English uh, so, that we were uh, a force to be reckoned with, that we were uh, really serious people, that our country ought to be taken seriously, um, that we were as good as they were. We needed to say that, which, which tells you something about an outlier to the to the metropolis 
which we were. We look to that metropolis. We look to London uh, in particular uh, as the centre of the world mm. uh, because it was the centre of our world in, in 1914. It really was. Uh, and so there is a need on our part to show um, we're fair dinkum, we're, we're true uh, British uh, subjects who can stand up and fight with the best of them. So we're not only showing the Germans and the Turks, we're showing the English as showing well. Showing the English as well. Just an interesting yeah. comment here. Um, you know, Bean's weakness was his projection and colouring. And I think, yeah, that's the storytelling element, you know. Don't worry about yes. the facts so much or, you know, just, just no. how you show them, how you portray them, or, you know, journalists. So I suppose it will make sense. <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah. And and that comment is, is, is very right. Bean was less good. He was good at gathering facts um the person said which is right less uh less skilled in in uh, articulating a sophisticated argument i think yeah, yeah. um so so robin just kind of i i, I want to kind of bring in and have a bit of discussion here as well about how the second world war differed and you mentioned also um I just had a few questions which we'll come to shortly just about um australia's relationship with japan because the, the yes. change that went on there was obviously quite significant. But in terms of, you know, when war was declared in 1939, how did that go down? What was the difference in response um, to the first world? It's, it's interesting. It's interesting because in the interwar period, Australia didn't really have that different a migration policy uh, than we'd had before 1914. It was the white Australia policy before 1914, and it was the white Australia policy after 1914. So the composition of the population is not changing much. Um, there's the first, uh, I think, signs of xenophobia in the population. We, we won't, for example, take Jewish refugees. Uh, we are very, very poor at that. And we argue at the Evian conference in, in France against us taking anybody at all. We do take a few hundred uh, uh, in the end, but it's a miserable policy. And it's the first signs of creeping xenophobia, I think, in our immigration policy. We haven't had to worry about xenophobia before. We just kept everybody who wasn't British out. Uh, <laughs> that was easy. Yeah. Simple. But it's getting a bit more difficult here, and uh, we are not doing all that well. The thing about that is the composition of the population in 1939 is not all that different from 1914, overwhelmingly still Anglo-Celtic. There is one, however, big difference. In 1931, by an act of the British Parliament, they passed the Statute of Westminster, December 1931. This is designed to give the Dominions autonomy. We can have our own foreign policy. Britain wants it. Depths of depression in Britain, of course. Um, uh, things not going well. Um, they are quite willing for us to go uh, on our own to some extent anyway. But guess what? We don't ratify it. Um, it's, it doesn't come into effect until it's ratified by the Home Parliament. Canada ratifies it. We don't. It just lays on the table um, of the uh, House of Representatives and it stays there. Why? It's a good question. <laughs> did, 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 in fact, the government completely forget it, uh, forget about it, the statute? Was, you'd think not, given its importance. Kind of um, a big deal. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is we had conservative governments uh, in, that, in the 30s. Maybe they felt no need uh, to implement it. Uh, maybe they were happy w enough with the status quo. Whatever the reason, 1939 comes around and we're still in the same position we were in 1914. Uh, the Prime Minister, Robert Menzies, uh, makes a speech at the time, September the 3rd, and says Britain is now at war with Germany and as a consequence, Australia is also at war 
with Germany. He's literally right. He's absolutely correct. People said this was his own decision, Menzies being rather known for being pro-British. It's not. Menzies is also a lawyer. He knows the law, and the law is the same as it was in 1914. Uh, So George VI declares war on our behalf this time uh, in 1939. Um, It's one of the mysteries of the age that we don't get around to ratifying the Statute of Westminster. When Britain wants us to, there's no problem from that point of view. We just don't do it. So like, uh, you know, someone whose job it was to, to, to move that forward got distracted with something else, didn't want to say yes, anything. I mean, you know what I mean? I, I, Procrastinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, again, we're at war um, in September 39 uh, as a result of Britain's declaration of war. So it's the king, a different king, but still a king, and uh, we enter the war. And once again... There's almost no controversy about that. Um, There are no debates. Um, And I think partly that's because who we're at war against. I mean, there's nothing like a bunch of Nazis to solidify the population uh, uh, in in, in that sort of way. And I think this is what what happens. I'm recruiting for the, uh, the Army Reserve, the Citizens Military Force, it was called, in the 30s goes up quite a lot. Uh, my father-in-law, for example, joins in the 30s to to because he realises there's going to be a reckoning with this bloke Hitler, um, and he's right. In 1939, the reckoning comes, and we we behave in much the same way as we did in 1914, except this time there are no Japanese heavy cruisers to escort us across uh, <laughs> the Pacific. That's, a, that's another, another question. Um, but we are uh, escorted in, in the big ships, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth, uh, and we finish up, guess where, in Egypt again, um, back there in 1939. Um, um, just a... Just to pause, just just to come back to briefly this idea of why this wasn't ratified. Um, Mark makes the point that maybe they yeah. felt no need because there was it. Oh was, yeah, they were happy with the okay. status quo, you know. I think they probably were. Uh, I mean, all, all governments at that time were pro-imperial, um, and 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 I don't think there's uh, there would have been a great deal of uh, controversy one way or another. So they just decided with the status quo, go with the status quo. I think, yeah, I think that's quite right. Yeah. So there we are in Egypt again in <laughs> 1939, but with one little difference this time. Uh, there's a brigade of Australians that gets to Britain, um, and we're there in 1940. And if Britain had been invaded, um, there would have been in the front line actually in 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 Kent. And Sussex, there would have been Australian, New Zealand, uh, and Canadian troops as well. Um, we took that threat pretty seriously, um, and the other troops would have followed uh, to Britain uh, had the had the threat increased. Uh, it diminished uh, as winter came on in 1940, and we stayed in Egypt because after Dunkirk. Uh, that was not the second front, that was the first front, the only front, in fact, that Britain had. So there we were in the desert, where we stayed uh, until, of course, 1941. Yeah. And was, just to kind of change guess slightly and just um, look just a little bit at the Australian home front, was the reaction, obviously the Second World War, one of the big differences, I suppose, is obviously the, the, the war in the Far East and how that impacted yeah. Australia, that threat was on the doorstep more so than in the First World War. Do you think that the, the reaction was even more enthusiastic in the Second World War than the First because of that and because actually there was a, a greater need for that mobilisation on the home front perhaps? I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I, th- I think there was, I, I mean... It's, it's a hard one, this. I think there was enough enthusiasm 
Um, if you look at the incidence of dock strikes, for example, they're much greater in the Second World War when the war's much closer to us than they were in the first. Um, there, are, there is a reluctance to send volunteers uh, overseas, um, mm. even New Guinea. Um, that's questioned. Uh, so it's hard to say, actually, that, uh, uh, about that. Um, I mean, yes, there was war, war in the, the Far East or the Near North, uh, as we call it um, here. But, uh, it, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, mm. I think the First World War had left scars uh, that people were under no illusion about what war meant. Um, and that it meant casualties in, in, in quite some number. Um, there is no doubt a scarring effect uh, here as there is in Britain, um, which makes the decision in a way to go to war on Britain's part as well as ours all the more remarkable. And uh, I think, again, tells you about something about who we were fighting in uh, 1939 and, and, and 40. Um, but, uh, I mean... We have a government in 1939 with a majority of one. Uh, Robert Menzies is in by one. Uh, do we form a national government? Not on your life. Uh, we have the fine example of uh, Churchill uh, in uh, 1940. Um, Menzies is not all that keen on Churchill, actually. There's a great myth uh, grown up since that time about what great friends they were. They weren't really. Um, Menzies goes to England in, uh, in 1940-41 and um, hawks around successors to Churchill a bit. He speaks with people like Lloyd George, for example, who's pretty offside with Churchill at that stage, uh, going through one of his defeatist uh, moods. Uh, and and Churchill talk, uh, Menzies talks to him and, and to others who are not entirely at one with Churchill. And uh, Menzies has a real go at the great man over the Dakar fiasco, which you might think had nothing to do with us <laughs> in Australia whatsoever. But Menzies is very exercised. He's not been told about the expedition um, and he's not been told why it, why it was defeated. And he's 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 quite offside with Winston over that one. Um, quite interesting that. Mm. Um, so there's there's a bit of tension there. And then of course, Menzies loses his majority. There's an election, and the new man comes in, John Curtin, who one of the first acts of whom is to ratify the Statute of Westminster in 1942. Uh, so we have our own foreign policy uh, now, but 1942 is not a good time to have a foreign policy, actually. Um, and Curtin uh, does some fancy footwork and shifts our focus uh, to the United States. Um, there's a very controversial article he writes, Curtin writes, for a newspaper where he says, we turn without fear or favour uh, to now from Britain to the United States. And this doesn't go down well with one W. Uh, yes. Churchill. Uh, goes down very badly, in fact, because, of course, unbeknown to Curtin, because no one had told him, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt had worked out that Australia will fall within the American sphere of influence. They've done that themselves in Washington. Um, they haven't told us. Uh, great powers tend not to tell small powers what they're doing. And uh, uh, the first curtain hears about it is Churchill's response to, to this article saying, you know, what are you getting your knickers in a twist for? I've got it all sorted out. Uh, Franklin and I have come to an agreement. You know, and Curtin says, well, news to me. Yeah, to uh, somebody which, let which me know. <laughs> Which it is, yeah. yeah, yeah, and people think this is the great turning point in Australian history. You know, 1942, we're now a satellite of the United States, uh, we don't care about Britain anymore. Um, not much we do. This, this is quite wrong, 
it's mm. quite wrong. Uh, one of the future projects I have in mind is an addition of the Churchill Curtin correspondence. Um, they correspond very frequently during the war, which tells you something. And the centre of Curtin's world is still London. It's not yeah. Washington. If, if you didn't care, you wouldn't. You know, you, you wouldn't be engaged in in this constant correspondence, these constant debate. You just yeah. the reaction would be different. It would be dismissive almost, wouldn't it? You'd expect. Yeah. I um, mean, there are. There are straws in the wind in this correspondence too. Um, we need a new governor general. Um, one's retiring, and Churchill offers Wavell, which is a big deal. I mean, Wavell's reputation, despite the setbacks in the Western Desert, is still pretty high. Yeah, at that point. And yeah. Curtin turns Wavell down and says, "No, we don't, Wavell. We want a member of the royal family." Yeah. This is the guy who's. Not, Looking to America without fear or favour, I remember, five minutes ago. Um, yes, he's not quiet. So we get the Duke of Gloucester. I mean, his wish is fulfilled. Um, Britain sends 900 Spitfires to uh, Australia uh, during the war. Uh, mm. We are praised by Dr Evatt, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and head of the Socialist Left faction in the <laughs> Labor Party. Um he says if there's a choice between Britain or Australia going down, then Australia must go down. This is the socialist left in this country saying this. Uh, Self-sacrifice. fairly British here, yeah. yeah. Um, just a, a question that's come in, just kind of winding the clock back slightly, um, coming from Ian Carr about Australia's views in the 1930s, how much influence they had in the kind of discussions that, that were going on at that time. We had as much influence as Chamberlain wanted us to have, which at times w was a lot. Uh, our basic line was sell out anybody, but keep the peace. That was our line. Munich, fantastic. We've only given away a piece of Czechoslovakia. That's all right then. You know, no, we are staunch appeasers, mm -hmm. absolutely fanatical appeasers. Yeah, yeah. We 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 out Chamberlain uh, Chamberlain really uh, in uh, in the in the late thirties yeah Interesting. and Chamberlain uses that uh, when he's arguing with people like Churchill. Well, the Dominions are on my side, which we were. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just uh, I'm just going to pick up a couple of questions now, Robin, as we've got a I've got a moment to do so. Um, Question come in here and leaning back, I suppose, into lots of different things, but potentially a bit of the Anzac myth. But but also this idea that the Australian officers leadership was somehow better um, than that of uh, the, the British Army itself. I mean, I, I would argue not so much, but what do you think? Yeah, the, the problem with that argument is we learnt what we learnt mainly from the British. Um I mean, you know, the creeping barrage is not invented by a bunch of Australians, although you could argue our most important con contribution to the First World War is the, our part in the invention of sound ranging. Uh, Sir Lawrence Bragg, um, after whom the laboratories in my home university are named, really invents sound ranging. I mean, the French also invent it, uh, as do the Germans, but... Bragg takes a major role in the British uh, development of sound ranging, so important in 1918. As for the uh, officers, um, I don't know. Um, people like Monash, uh, of course, come to mind. Um, Monash was a good corps commander, but, but so were others. I mean, you know, Curry, yeah. uh, Maxey. Um, I'm not so sure. Uh, 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 we pick up so much from the British learning process ourselves. Um, if you want to talk about learning curves, which usually I don't, uh, <laughs> but if you do, we were sort of on the same curve as the British. I mean, if you look at us on the Somme, where did we get on the Somme? Where did the Australian <laughs> Army get? Nowhere. We got nowhere. Um, we captured Pozier. Well, wonderful. Um what else do we do? Not much, because we are following the doctrine of the time, uh, which is a pretty poor one. Uh, and by 1918, 
we are following other doctrines, as is most of the British Army. So I'm not sure you can separate that, those out as much as the question might indicate. Yeah, I've always thought that it's um, it's a case of cherry picking individuals. This is the difference between individuals and actually you can put people in boxes and then try and develop other things to fit your arguments around it. And um, that's always yes. been my, my view on that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Let's see what other, <clears throat> other questions we've got. Um, Just, uh, just some really interesting contributions, actually, and, and comments on um, the wider dominions, I guess. So there's been a lot of chat in the sidebar and sort of comparisons and discussions about New Zealand and Canada and and, and how different or similar um, the reactions were across the dominions. And there was a question that came in um, around about yeah. how much the communication went on between the dominions. So, for example, you know, the relate what was the relationship between Australia and Canada? Yeah, not much. Not much. No, no. I mean, friendly, uh, of course, uh, but in uh, constantly in touch, absolutely not. No, no. Uh, uh, New Zealand is, is probably an exception to that. Uh, we, like, we like to think we look after New Zealand. Um, so the, the, the ties there were, would, would have been stronger and the communications more uh, uh, frequent. But no, no. Um, the thing about Chamberlain, though, you know, he's using the Dominions here to do what he wants to do in 1937. I mean, we're a handy tool for him to wave about uh, as if Dominion policy, Dominion opinion counted for much in London in 1937. It didn't. Um, they knew we'd be with uh, Britain, if if war was declared, uh, they didn't have to worry about that sort of thing. Uh, so Chamberlain, I think, is is using us for his own purposes. Mm. And if he if he hadn't had us, he'd have had something else. And um, Mark's picking up here, uh, mentioning Lawrence Wackett, obviously the Allied, uh, the father of this aviation, Australian aviation, or whatever it is he's known as. But this idea, of course, that the Somme wasn't a disaster in all ways and uh, just picking up on this wider contribution. Um, I remember ages ago, I wrote something, I can't remember an article I was writing about the Australian, this idea of um, word, you know, word the le leadership, uh, better quality and all the rest of it. And I did mention the scientific and technical contribution from Australia was probably as you as you said bigger in some ways and it's not often spoken about no it's not uh, i mean lawrence bragg is i mean, no one would know his name here i wouldn't have thought um even people at the university uh, who walk past the bragg laboratories uh, I, I suspect wouldn't know what contribution bragg uh, had made mm. um i mean when war breaks out he's guess where he's in cambridge uh, because uh, whatever you can do in Australia, you can't yet do higher research. Um, you can't do, for example, a PhD. Uh, you can't in an Australian university until 1947, I think. Uh, um, up until then, you did masters, and uh, that was good enough for you. But so Bragg's in Cambridge and uh, is pretty rapidly conscripted into this uh, these scientists, which the British do pretty well operational research they do it much better than the germans for example the germans are terrible at operational research uh the military not allowing civilians uh in, into their own territory um so yeah bragg is, is extraordinarily important i mean when you think of the importance of artillery you know, in those victories in 1918 the fact they could hit what they pointed at was pretty important yeah 100 percent and yeah I want to just, um, as we kind of, I don't want to keep you for, for too much longer, and we're coming up to the final 10 minutes of, of the of the show slot here. Um, I want to go back and, and, and talk a little bit about uh, Japan, because for me, that's yeah. always been an interesting area. Um, you know, my, um, many of our viewers will know, uh, my grandfather fought in the, in the Far East, and the change uh, politically that Japan went through is, is one thing, but Australia's relationship and that 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 change and how Australia reacted um, to that. Can you speak to that, Robin, a little bit? Yeah. Well, we we were we believed uh, London. Uh, we believed in the Singapore naval base. 
because we wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, Britain said to, to Australia basically this, we'll pretend to build a naval base. And we said, uh, we'll pretend to believe you. Um, <laughs> like that's, that. that's about it. Uh, that's about it. Um, we knew the problems of the naval base, um, but we didn't really want to face them because facing them meant two things. It meant acknowledging that Japanese policy had changed for the worse as far as we were concerned, uh, and, and pretty rapidly in the late 20s, early 30s. Um, and the other thing, of course, was the cost. I mean, for Australia, the naval base was a doozy. I mean, we'd have to pay for it. Fantastic. Uh, we are defending the empire uh, by a contribution of no money at all. Well, not very much. Um, we wanted to believe it. And when Churchill keeps telling us Japan won't do a mad dog act like attacking Singapore. We believe him. Um, now, whether he believed it or not is another question, mm. but we certainly believed it, which is why the fall of Singapore comes as such a shock. I mean, I think this is a genuine uh, shock. We, we, we Suddenly the mask is ripped off and imperial defence is, is down the drain you know, in, a, in a matter of weeks. Um, this is a pretty shocking uh, event here. Um, what is amazing, though, because you think this might have altered our relationship with Britain uh, for the worse, uh, was the short duration of that fractiousness between Australia and Britain. It, it's very short, a matter of months, really. We're back on the British bandwagon. And we've got MacArthur, too. We've got, you know. And, and, and Curtin is whinging to Churchill about MacArthur, um, as he had every right to do. Uh, MacArthur uh, was not an easy commander to, uh, to follow. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we're back on the British bandwagon pretty quickly. Yeah, I am. Um, I mean, you know, Singapore is a is a, a show. I'm sure for World War Two TV, and and, and a, a lot can be said there. But it seems strikes me a case of, you know, a combination maybe of of trust in in Westminster, but also don't ask questions because it's the easier taking the slightly easier route, perhaps. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, it's clear. It's clear in 1940 that Britain has no fleet to send, main fleet to Singapore, it is not going to happen, um, especially after the problems in the Mediterranean. I mean, okay, deal with the French fleet, uh, to some extent, actually. I mean, it's not all sunk at Mersey or Kabir, the French fleet. Most of it's in Toulon. Uh, and it needs watching, and it needs ships in the Mediterranean to watch it. Also, that's the only fighting front Britain's got. It's not going to send its ships to a front that's not yet not yet in, in, in place, which Churchill keeps saying, we can only fight where we're fighting. And, you know, to the extent he's right, uh, but there's nothing in the cupboard. And once the American fleet is sunk at Pearl Harbour, we've got nothing. Mm. Mm. Um, right, guys, um, we've got <coughs> five more minutes. Um, any more questions, do get them in. Um, Robin... The other thing that I kind of want to discuss, I mean, I, I touch on because it's, it's a huge subject, is you mentioned before that obviously Australia, from a, a military point of view, followed, um, obviously, in the First World War, British trained, followed this, this general learning curve. How did, how did the, the military itself shift in the interwar period? Was there much of a shift or was it pretty, pretty mirroring that the British kind of response of a bit of a loss of learning and, and kind of then a regeneration, as it were, early in the Second World War? You can argue, I think, you're looking at the... Uh, it's very interesting looking at the early battles in the Western Desert uh, because all our commanders there uh, fought in the First World War, um, at Amiens in particular. Now, if you look at the uh, campaigns in the Western Desert, uh, Bardia and Tobruk, uh, we are really using am, uh, Amion methods. We're using sound ranging, we're using creeping barrages, and we are keeping our artillery concentrated. Um, you could argue that we are ahead of the British commanders in the Western Desert at that time, uh, who went on 
decentralizing things in these ludicrous uh, drop columns and so on, uh, which Rommel kept cleaning up one at a time and did it for a couple of years um, until Montgomery comes along and reinstates what we'd been doing in 1940. Um, concentrate the guns. Uh, don't go. Don't try and go too far. Uh, don't send the tanks out against tanks because you'll run into anti-tank guns. So I could, you could argue in 1940, we've kept those lessons of 1918 pretty much firmly in our grasp, uh, where some British commanders have not. Yeah, yeah we're, we're hoping to have a have a show coming up with Rob Lyman on his new. A new book ah, speaking about yeah. that that that, that yeah. lot of, of learning as it were in the interwar period um yeah this has been this has been brilliant robin i mean we usually end shows with i i personally end them with more questions than when we started for me that's a success and i've got lots of threads to pull on now um, when it comes to my understanding of of australia and and the differences i suppose in in the first and second world war but mainly the similarities of, of the reaction there um what are your to, to, to end, what were your kind of final thoughts on maybe the, the biggest misunderstandings or, or, or myths around the Australian narrative as it stands at the moment? Yeah, there's there's always always the thing with Britain. Um, we find it difficult to have a sensible relationship with Britain, uh, as children often do. Uh, with their parents, and uh, it's a cliche here, but it's one that holds a bit of truth. I mean, you know, the greatest crisis that we faced in uh, the 20th century was was not a matter of war or peace. It was a matter of cricket. Uh, it was a matter of body line bowling. Um, now, there's a real crisis, and telegrams are going to and from Whitehall uh, in 1933, like never before, or I suspect never since. Um, and what we're concerned about with body line is that you've got the fastest fast bowler in the world, something we always want to have, and he's using tactics which we don't know what to do with. Um, terrible stuff. Mother Britain um, turning on her children like that. Uh, that's worse than either world war, I think. I mean, for goodness sake, world wars yeah, will we'll be in any of those. But yeah, to you talk know, about if the you start messing around with cricket, you, you know, really try. And and recently, the baseball phenomenon with British cricket, uh, English cricket, it caused an uproar here. We are the only ones playing true test cricket. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's quite interesting to to look at this. A world war, nothing at all. You mess around with cricket at your peril. My <laughs> God, you do. Yeah. Um, well, we'll take it in your stride. Not a big deal, but. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Test cricket, my goodness, that's serious <laughs> stuff. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. I guess. So, uh, too prominent in our history? Yeah. Um, oh, yes, probably. <laughs> um, probably. Um, but look, it's, it's driven by. By the population, I, I think that's another myth that it's it's military people who drive this uh, ANZAC phenomenon. Uh, it's not really. Um, if you look at the what is the most visited place in Australia, it's not the Sydney Opera House. It's the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. Um, no one's forcing people to go to the War Memorial; mm -hmm. uh, they just do. Uh, so I think while the, the myth. And Anzac holds such a – the population in, in, is so interested in it, then that's the way it's going to be. Whatever academics and the like think of that uh, is, is rather beside the point. It's what the people think of it that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a good note as any to end on, really. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Robin. It's been an absolute Well, thank pleasure. you, Lucy. Yeah, enjoyed it. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, thank you to everybody for, for joining us wherever you are in the world, whatever time it is. Um, and I uh, hope to see you again. Our next show is on, oh, yeah, surprise show coming up tomorrow with Peter Hart at 7 p.m. Uh, British summertime. So do join Try us for that one. <laughs> trying to rehabilitate Sir Douglas Haig, no doubt. Yeah. Yes, well, I'm sure there's going to be a, a very, um, a very, you know, responsive and um, uh, let's say, 
lively debate in the sidebar on that one. So I'm looking okay. forward to it. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.